Thank you, Gil. Yes, this is definitely a topic that it lends itself to opinions, unfortunately. Uh, all right. So um, we'll, we'll cover the, briefly cover the rationale for therapeutic drug monitoring, what it is, how do we perform it, when to perform it. Um, a fair, I, I will give the way that I practice, and it'll be great to hear how others are practicing, and then we'll go with the concept of therapeutic drug monitoring as it applies to other non-TNF-targeted biologics and oral small molecules. Um, so the concept of therapeutic drug monitoring basically implies the measurement of drug or active metabolite levels and anti-drug antibodies in the case of biologics to optimize IBD therapy. And we think that it'll help because there is a drug concentration response effect. So if you look at the figures, this is from the Sonic study, clear association between what the infliximab trough concentrations were and the rates of achieving corticosteroid-free uh, clinical response. Remember, association data, not causation data, and I'll come back to it. There is intra-individual variability in drug clearance, depending on what the patient's clinical status is, as their CRP, as their albumin changes, it can significantly impact drug clearance, such that within the same individual, there may be variation in drug clearance from time to time. And there is inter-individual variability with multiple factors that play a part in impacting drug clearance, including sex, disease-related factors, drug-related factors, and we'll talk about some of those things. How do we perform therapeutic drug monitoring? Uh, we have a choice of multiple different assays. Are different assays for therapeutic drug monitoring comparable? Uh, in my viewpoint, and based on limited data that we have, for assessment of trough concentration, that is probably correct. We know that for infliximab assays, an inter-assay variability in trough concentration is roughly about minus 7 to plus 20 percent. Industry standards say that up to plus minus 20 percent is okay. For adalumumab assays, there's limited data. There were, or based on one small study, there was considerable differences between the homogeneous mobility shift assay, which is the Prometheus assay, and an ELISA comparable assay. Uh, but overall, and the general consensus in the field is that for measuring, measuring trough concentrations, all different assays are probably comparable. On the other hand, for anti-drug antibodies, quantitatively, they are not similar. Qualitatively, depending on how you interpret the results, they may provide similar um, ideas or uh, actions that you take. In generally, the, my general advice is preferable to use the same assay for repeated measurements within the same patient and be comfortable with using one assay, one lab, because then you know what their antibody thresholds are and how you uh, respond to those, rather than moving from one lab to other for multiple different patients. This is just an overview of the commonly available labs for therapeutic drug monitoring. There are four that I know of. The Prometheus assay, which is a homogeneous mobility shift assay, is a drug-tolerant assay, meaning that you can measure both antibodies and drug in uh, conjunction with each other, says that a result will report trough concentration as well as anti-drug antibodies. It's probably the one that is best studied. Uh, and uh, the downside of that is that it can be costly. You have ways and hoops to jump, and you should eventually end up paying $75 out of pocket, if that. The LabCorp or the, or the esoterics assay is an ECLIA assay available for uh, most of the medications. Again, a drug-tolerant assay. Uh, seems to have a better coverage, although I'm from California and San Diego, we invariably use Prometheus, uh, but other, uh, talking to others, esoterics is uh, much more readily available. Here, bear in mind that the antibody levels are pretty confusing. I have yet to see an esoterics assay where the antibody was not positive. Uh, Mayo has its own lab, which is a drug-sensitive assay in the sense it will only report drug uh, antibody levels in the absence of drug, or if the drug level is zero, it'll report the presence or absence of antibodies. And likewise, Miraka assay, which is available for multiple medications and is an ELISA assay, is also a drug-sensitive assay, wherein in the presence of drug, it will not report the presence or absence of antibodies. How do, how do you interpret and how do you intervene uh, based on levels that are available? I always say 
look at the trough concentration first, and then look at the antibodies if you need to. The reason for that is, if you look at drug clearance and if you look at how we respond to these interventions, Across studies, roughly about 50% of people who have sub so people may have subtherapeutic drug concentration as a reason for failure. Within those, roughly 50% would have failed just because of low drug concentration with undetectable antidrug antibodies. In those instances, increasing the drug, the index drug, should work, or adding an immunomodulator should work. On the other hand, if you have subtherapeutic more so absent drug concentration, it is very helpful to look at the presence or absence of antibodies. And in those instances, we call it an immune-mediated pharmacokinetic failure. No matter how much drug you give, it will not be beneficial. It is better to switch the patient, typically within class, uh, or some suggestion, adding an immunomodulator, but we'll come to uh, some of those aspects. Typically, you would be switching within class. The other groups of people who fail after responding to a particular medication can fail despite having therapeutic drug concentrations. These are the people who we think have a mechanistic or a pharmacodynamic failure, and this roughly accounts for 25% of people who we think have a secondary loss of response after initially responding. In these instances, typically switching out of class would be beneficial because we think that despite achieving adequate levels of a particular anti-TNF agent, the patient has stopped responding. It's probably a disease escape mechanism, so switching out of class may be beneficial. There are some people who have therapeutic drug concentration but still have detectable anti-drug antibodies. I do not consider anti-drug antibodies when somebody has a therapeutic drug concentration. I do not look at those. Uh, so first, again, reiterating this point, always look at the trough concentration. If the trough concentration is optimal for the goal that you're trying to achieve, then antidrug antibodies are probably inconsequential. On the other hand, if somebody has subtherapeutic drug concentrations, more so absent drug concentration, antidrug antibodies can explain the reason for that. When do you perform therapeutic drug monitoring? Touch upon two concepts of reactive and proactive. Uh, not necessarily comparing them. Reactive therapeutic drug monitoring is typically defined as, or the way that we think about is performed in response to active IBD. When I say active IBD, it does not have to be a flaring patient. It can be somebody who has clinically quiescent disease, but has ongoing evidence of endoscopic disease activity, or has not achieved your treatment target. This can either happen after a period of quiescent disease, or it can be in the case of somebody who never really achieved remission and you're trying to measure drug levels to explain whether or not there may be benefit to optimization of the index medication. So the first question is, um, and this was addressed in the AZA guidelines, is in adults with active IBD treated with anti-TNF agents, is reactive therapeutic drug monitoring superior to treatment changes which are empirical? Most empirical treatment changes are escalate the drug first, if the patient does not respond, then switch to a different medication. So that's what the, uh, the comparison was here. Does, therape does therapeutic drug monitoring in a reactive setting help us? Only one randomized trial to date to, uh, I was proposed to inform this. Um, as you can see in this trial, there was no difference in the rates of achieving remission either with reactive therapeutic drug monitoring as compared to empirical treatment changes. In fact, numerically, empirical treatment changes seemed to be better or you were more likely to achieve remission. However, the biggest flaw in this paper is that they considered a therapeutic infliximab level as any infliximab that is present. So a level of 0.5 was considered as evidence that you have enough infliximab such that most people in this trial were deemed to have mechanistic failures, whereas if we think about it now, we say an adequate level is at least five, if not higher, so this was 10 times lower. So we relied on some observational data. Uh, two to three studies, which were comparing TDM-guided changes to empiric dose escalation, retrospective studies. Overall, across these 134 patients, if you deem how many patients responded, to dose escalation, roughly about 45%. However, now, within using the same data, if you break it down by TDM strata and look at non-immune mediated drug clearance, so these are the people who do not have anti-drug antibodies and have low levels, 
roughly 80% of those people responded to increasing the drug. On the other hand, if you look at people who had immune-mediated drug clearance, that is high anti-drug antibodies with an absent trough, only 8% of people responded. So clearly, by having information on which TDM strata they fall, you are likely to be able to make an informed decision on how they will respond to treatment. Similarly, the next step within these uh, uh, observational studies was, okay, they didn't respond to escalation of therapy. How about we empirically switch these people? And with switching the 52 people who had not responded to escalation of therapy, roughly 30% responded. Whereas here again, if you gui apply th uh, TDM guided changes, people with immune mediated clearance were switched within class and 80% of those people responded by switching within class as compared to people who had lower absent trough but no anti-drug antibodies. Uh, I'm sorry, it should not have been lower absent trough, it should have been adequate trough, no anti-drug antibodies. In those instances, empirically switching within class was not beneficial. Only two or 25% of patients responded by switching within class. So basically, if you're achieving therapeutic drug concentrations without anti-drug antibodies, here again, TDM data is useful to inform your treatment decisions. Um, but when we develop guidelines, there are, we, we think about guidelines in two uh, thoughts, any evidence, what are the potential benefits of any intervention, and what are the potential harms of intervention. Here the intervention is the concept of a flying therapeutic drug monitoring. Strictly adhering to therapeutic drug monitoring and associated or proposed cutoffs may sometimes result in inappropriate treatment changes in some patients who may have responded to empiric dose escalation. The concept of a, what is a therapeutic or what is an optimal trough, particularly during induction therapy, is unclear. So there will be a subset of people who will respond, if I say an adequate level is five, and I strictly adhere to said, anybody with a level of six, I'm gonna switch them out, I'm probably making a mistake because there may be some benefit to um, escalating higher. The optimal trough is dynamic. It may depend on your disease state, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, is it perianal disease? Am I trying to achieve endoscopic remission, histologic remission, or just clinical response? And finally, the concept of anti-drug antibodies gets a little challenging in day-to-day -day practice because there are no clearly well-defined cutoffs. A recent consensus statement from Gill and others in the field suggested that for the Prometheus assay, probably antibodies to infliximab of more than 10. And similarly, for, uh, 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 for the Miraka assay, a level of more than 200 is significant. However, for any of the other medications, there are no recommendations for what is an optimal um, or mean clinically meaningful anti-drug antibody levels. So what do the guideline statements say here? Uh, everybody agrees. So the AGA guidelines, a Sydney consensus statement from Australia, and a recently published Bridge Consensus Group, all of them suggest that reactive therapeutic drug monitoring to guide changes in patients with active IBD is probably the right approach. Um, and so we, I, I am glad we all agree for this. Remember that AGA guidelines and the Sydney consensus focused only on anti-TNF medications, whereas the recently uh, publish or online early bridge consensus statement, extra, uh, extend this to other non-TNF mediated medications where is the, they say that it is appropriate to order therapeutic drug monitoring in patients with secondary loss of response or primary non-response to verolizumab or ustekinumab. I will present some data related to that. What are the proposed drug concentration cutoffs? This is what the different groups had suggested. And here again, most people say the minimum needed. So in somebody with actively flaring disease, in which you're trying to figure out, hey, do I have, uh, do I really need to dose escalate or do I need to switch? Nobody says what is a good level. Everybody says you need to be at least five from an AGA standpoint. The Sydney consensus said for luminal disease, you need to be between three to eight. And if it's perianal disease, more than 10 whereas the BRISC consensus is at least three for maintenance of remission, more than seven for mucosal healing. In other words, do not even think about switching if the level is below this. So if the level is below five or below three, depending on whichever you adopt, do not even think about switching, escalate these people. 
If the level is above five, there is potential reason that they may benefit still from further escalation. If your outcome is clinical response, or if your outcome is endoscopic remission, you probably need to achieve higher levels. Uh, but you need to get to at least five before switching out. Similarly, for adalumumab, the AGA guidelines say a level of eight and a half. The Sydney consensus says keep it between five to 12. And the BRIS consensus says keep it at least five and more than seven for mucosal healing. Um, and in, specifically, they say is that in the presence of active disease, do not abandon until more than 10. And I think these statements are accurate. Do not abandon a drug until you're achieving a drug level of more than 10. However, if somebody at eight without any response whatsoever, never responded, you could still think about switching out of class. Uh, sertilizumab, Pegol, at least 20 and at least 15 based on two uh, statements. And for gulimumab, at least one for maintenance therapy, and I think it's 2.5 for induction therapy. Again, need to emphasize target thresholds may be higher if you're trying to achieve a, a more difficult to achieve outcome, such as mucosal healing, endoscopic remission, or if you're trying to achieve perianal disease. Um, and of course, all of this applies to maintenance therapy. If you're trying to apply uh, this to induction therapy, your trough concentrations that you're trying to target is definitely much higher. Moving on to the concept of proactive therapeutic drug monitoring or routine therapeutic drug monitoring, wherein patients, regardless of their clinical status, most often with clinically and endoscopically quiescent disease, periodically checking therapeutic drug monitoring as part of routine care, either do it once post-induction or do it continuously at periodic intervals. That's what we mean by proactive. So the next question that the AJA guidelines addressed was, in adults with quiescent IBD treated with an anti-TNF agent, is routine proactive therapeutic drug monitoring to guide prospective treatment changes superior to no TDM? So we're saying let them be or proactively monitor trough concentrations. Again, limited data to inform. <laughs> this was one randomized controlled trials which was looking at a treat to trough strategy uh, to see whether or not it may uh, be beneficial. 263 stable responders to maintenance in Flixinab. The trouble with this trial, and trying to interpret this trial, is that it has two phases. The first one was the optimization phase, wherein everybody had drug levels checked, and everybody was, uh, their drug levels were modified to keep it between three to seven. All of the patients underwent this. Once they were optimized, they were randomized to either continuously or with every infusion checking levels, or to let clinicians do what they typically, uh, what they do in usual care, which is change it in response to clinical changes. During the optimization phase, what they observed is that people who had low trough concentrations below three, by bringing them higher, a subset of Crohn's disease patients who were previously not in clinical remission were able to achieve clinical remission didn't apply for ulcerative colitis, although we are looking at 28 patients. And similarly, from a Crohn's disease standpoint, their C-reactive protein mean went down with dose escalation uh, uh, to optimize. But if you look at the maintenance phase, once you have been optimized and randomized them to a clinically guided dosing versus a concentration-based dosing, at the end of one year, no difference in rates of achieving clinical remission, which was the primary endpoint of the study. If you start looking carefully at secondary endpoints, and remember, this is only a one-year study. Things may be different if you extend it longer. The rates of achieving rescue therapy with corticosteroids were lower if you were using a treat-to-trough uh, strategy as opposed to clinically guided dosing, which may make sense to me. The ability to keep an infliximab within a target range was higher if you're using a treat-to-trough. I'm glad that is true, otherwise it's a failure of the intervention. Um, and the rates of achieving, uh, of having undetectable trough concentrations were significantly lower in the tree to trough strategy, which again makes sense. They followed this up long term, and um, again, at the end of three years, no significant differences between a people who were initially randomized to a tree to trough strategy versus a clinically guided dosing. A big caveat here, the routine practice in the group was to check a trough concentration at least once a year. So everybody at the end of the randomized phase of one trial was getting at least one trough concentration a year. Uh, this was another trial 
that uh, a therapeutic drug monitoring trial called the Taylorix trial recently published, which looked, like, looked at 122 biologic naive patients with Crohn's disease starting a combination therapy with infliximab and an immunomodulator. And they were randomized at week 14 to either infliximab dose escalation based purely on symptoms or symptoms and biomarkers or a low trough concentration. And they looked at a primary endpoint of achieving corticosteroid free remission for a period of time um, and absence of ulcers at week 52. Again, small study, three groups. Uh, the, the three groups is they had different strategies of how to escalate, whether it should be five mix per keg or two and a half or what. Uh, but in essence, if you compare, combine the two groups where it was only clinically guided or based on symptoms versus the people was, where escalation was performed for symptoms and biomarkers or low trough concentrations, again, no differences in rates of achieving corticosteroid free remission. This is still not the right intervention, this is still not the right trial, because people could have escalated just based, purely based on uh, symptoms alone without biomarkers. An ideal comparison for TDM should have been uh, symptoms and biomarkers alone, or symptoms and biomarkers, or a low trough concentration, and that would have been more informative. So there's indirect evidence clearly to support the concept of proactive therapeutic drug monitoring. We talked about a concentration response relationship. We know that early anti-TNF levels can predict future outcomes. And there is a lower risk of developing anti-drug antibodies and higher persistence on indic therapy with proactive TDM. I said this is association data. So the concept of is it the exposure that is predicting response or is it the response predicting exposure? Because if you're improving, your CRP decreases, your albumin improves, you're not going to be clearing the drug as quickly. So maybe that's why your trough concentrations are higher. So we need to keep that in mind uh, with any of these association data. And there are some potential harms. Uh, target troughs for patients in remission is poorly defined with suboptimal discriminatory thresholds. And more importantly, what do we do with this incidentally diagnosed anti-drug antibody? I wasn't expecting to find it, but now I have a patient whose infliximab concentration is zero and has high anti-drug antibodies, uh, but this is a patient in remission, what do I do? Uh, and, and finally, the feasibility and resource utilization. Again, everything that we talked about is infliximab related. How does it extrapolate to other anti-TNF agents or other non-TNF mediated, uh, non-TNF targeting biologics? Guideline statements here vary. Uh, the AGA makes no recommendation either in favor of or against routine proactive TDM. Uh, the Sydney consensus says that it should be considered at the end of induction therapy and periodically, but they call it recommendation grade C or D. And if you look at C and D, it says just be careful how you implement it. So do it if you know what you're doing. Uh, the bridge consensus says that it is appropriate at the end of induction and at least once during maintenance for all patients with anti-TNFs, but there's no consensus on doing it for Vito or use chikinimab. Um, so some lack of consensus. This is what I do. OK, yes, I do. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip on this. <laughs> so the, the, the other debate is, is it, should we do proactive versus reactive? Uh, in my mind, this is a moot question because you're looking at two different patient populations. The reactive is typically done in people who are already failing therapy as compared to proactive. So uh, this is the flow chart, but it's available in the AGA guidelines, uh, and it's available in the handout. Typically, in active IBD, first check if the trough concentrations are adequate. If they are adequate, and again, the, your definition of adequate may vary depending on your target, then you can consider switching out of class. If they are inadequate, then look at the anti-drug antibodies. And for people who have lower absent trough but no anti-drug antibodies, escalate your index therapy. If you have an absent trough but high titer antibodies, then switch, out of, uh, switch within class. Uh, whereas for quiescent disease, uh, at this point, no recommendation in favor or against. Um, final few slides, TDM for non-TNF targeted biologics. Uh, for ustukinumab, there is, um, like I said, I believe that for cytokine antagonists, there is probably more of a role of assessing trough concentrations. There is an ex apparent exposure response relationships. At week eight, they said a trough of more than 3.4 is good, and for maintenance, they said a trough of 1.1 to 1.4. Um, 
in practice, I do things a little differently because there's an observational uh, study that says a level of more than 4.5. Typically, I'm using istuquinumab as a second or third line agent. I try to keep uh, and maximize the medication if I can. For vedolizumab, there seems to be an association. Um, although, mechanistically speaking, the way we think vedolizumab works, we would expect saturation at very low trough concentrations. Here, I think uh, Vero is probably, I, I always uh, question whether it's the chicken or the egg here. And finally, for tofacitinib, again, remember this is an oral small molecule in contrast to the high molecular weight monoclonal antibodies. Pharmacokinetics of small molecules is very different from large monoclonal antibodies. There is a linear relationship between tofacitinib dose and tofacitinib blood concentrations. There is no concept of immunogenicity uh, to small molecules, so in my mind, TDM is not relevant for tofacitinib or would not be valuable for any small molecule. Uh, so in summary, uh, considerable intra-individual variability, reactive TDM is routinely recommended. Proactive TDM may be helpful in selected cases, in my opinion. Always review the trough concentration first and, and then look at antibodies if you need to. And I'll stop there.